open that. Can we have a round of applause for the next session? <laughs> That was the second time that I've seen this movie. I'm really glad that I could see it again and like pick up on even more things. Um, I also, in the past few weeks, have watched all five of your movies, some of including Mud with Matthew McConaughey and Loving, showing the story of the Lovings uh, going to the Supreme Court. Um, I also noticed that Michael Shannon, the man who played the dad in this movie, is in every single one of your movies. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like working with an actor from your very first film all the way through your whole career, and how do you choose that line? Well, uh, in a lot of ways, Michael Shannon taught me how to be a director. Uh, I was really lucky to get him in my first film, Shotgun Stories. He had been in a, a short film that a professor of mine in college had made. And when I saw him, I guess it was just before my junior year of college, I said, that's the guy I want to you know, write a film for. And when I was writing Shotgun Stories, I wrote the lead role in that film for him specifically, even though I'd never met him. And when it came time to make it, um, I finally got up the nerve to ask the professor to give me his number. And I called him and, and said, you don't know me, I'm a kid from Arkansas, but uh, I've written a part for you. And that was in 2004. And I think at that time, not many people had written lead roles for him. So he was willing to read it. And, and luckily he, he responded to the script and, uh, and he came down to Arkansas to do it. Now I had made short films in college, but I'd never really worked with a professional actor before, certainly not somebody like Michael Shannon, who can be quite intimidating. And, um, and there were a handful of things, uh, really in the first week of shooting, that, that I picked up on. One was we had gotten ahead of schedule, uh, mainly because I was only shooting one or two takes, because uh, I was so nervous about spending money on the film. And he pulled me aside and he was like, look, nobody else here cares about this movie. And that was wrong, because there were some like, family members and stuff on set. <laughs> but um, his point was, you and I are the only ones that are accountable for what we're doing here. And, uh, and we have to make every single thing we do here matter. And I think it was an important lesson, because when you're, when you're on a film set, it's very easy to get distracted uh, and, and to lose track of the thing that's important, because you've got Lots of people standing around and lights and um, everybody's worried about lunch and just these things that in, in the real world at the time, they seem really important. But in the long run, you know, you cut to five, ten years later, someone's watching your film. All they care about is what happened between action and cut. And that's what Mike was, was trying to explain to me. Um, and, and there were a handful of other lessons. But uh, I think, too, my demeanor on set you know, really came from him. He, he's a very focused guy, he's a very serious guy, so we don't joke a lot on my sets. Um, and it was funny, when we made Mud, he was only there for a day or two, but I found myself still running a set that way. Uh, because, I don't know, it's a, it's a serious thing that you're doing. Even when you're making parts that are funny, it's still, um, it's still a job that, that I think you need to give some weight to. Um, if, if, it's, if it's worth doing, you know, is kind of the thinking. So, you know, Mike really, at this point, we're like brothers and, um, and partners in all this. I've written a new film that I hope to make in August, and he's one of the lead roles in that as well. And so um, I don't see it stopping any, anytime soon. Um, he, uh, I just think he's one of the greatest actors in the world, and he makes what I do better, for sure. Uh, he can say the lines in a way that um, really elevates them from even when, where I consider them to be. And most importantly, he can fill the space in between lines with, uh, with meaning. And not everybody can do that. And so I think he and I, especially with the style of writing that I have, uh, we suit each other. That's really cool. So um, going back to Mud, I actually met uh, one of the kids in that movie, Jacob Laughlin. Yeah. 
um, and he told us when he was starting out, that was his first role, and that um, his parents encouraged him to take it, being that the requirements were that he knew how to drive a motorcycle. <laughs> motorcycle, yeah, thank you. Driving a motorcycle and a boat. Um, and he had never acted before, but that was his first role in a considerably big movie. Um, what do you think the difference is between someone who's never acted before and, you know, child actors or even, you know, older actors who have never been in a movie before? How do you pick and choose and what's your preference? That's a great question. Uh, the, there's a big difference between Mike Shannon and a, uh, a person that's never acted before. Um, oddly, though, there is a, a result that can be close. Uh, and I think for a lot of people making, making first-time films and short films, uh, you might not always have access to really great actors, although I think actors are more accessible than, than people sometimes think. And I always say, if, if there's an actor that you're interested in, by all means pursue them. Don't, uh, don't take yourself out of the running before you've even given yourself a shot, number one. But uh, I think working with people that haven't acted a lot is a really beautiful thing. And, and there are a lot of different approaches. You know, uh, Terrence Malick, who's also an Austin-based filmmaker, uh, you know, he doesn't give uh, kids at least uh, scripts to read. Uh, he's just really curious about catching them in a moment, so he'll tell them what the situation is, and then they, I assume he does this, I've never been on one of his sets, and then he, he tries to catch them in a, in a moment of honesty that is kind of, you know, brought forth from their own minds. My stuff's too scripted to do that. So in college, I realized um, there's a guy that I put in my first film that was in the screenwriting program. His name is Doug Ligon. And I put him in my first feature film as one of the leads. Uh, partly because I think we were at film school and he'd been in so many short films that he realized they just weren't very important. Uh, and so he, he just didn't mind being in front of the camera. And the same was for Jacob. Uh, so many people, myself included, when a camera is on them, uh, they change, they, they tense up, they, they start to act. And, uh, and there are certain people in the world, for whatever reason, that when you put a camera on them, they don't react that way. Now, they may be reacting some way, but it, it's interesting. It, it doesn't feel um, stiff or stifled in any way. And that's what I would say, if, if you're casting uh, your friends or anything else, that's what you need to look for. Um, are people that are just interesting in front of the camera. In Take Shelter, my second film, um, there is a, the daughter in that family is deaf. And we made a decision to, to cast a real deaf person, simply because as a child actor, I think the character was six, it seemed impossible to think that someone could, could turn off their hearing. Um, and there was one little girl that we found who had red hair, uh, and Jessica Chastain, who played the mother, has red hair. And she had cochlear implants. So she actually, um, she didn't have deaf speech. She um, really had, had had hearing for, for many years. And, but she could turn her hearing off. She could just, un, you know, take off the cochlear implants. You know, we were kind of giving each other high fives, thinking like, oh, wow, this is gonna be so much easier because I can then communicate with her in between takes and everything else. But we put her in front of a camera and we put Toba, who's the girl we ended up casting, who, who was deaf and did not have cochlear implants in front of a camera. And um, I think we had a, a, a casting person just uh, kind of interacting with them, playing with them. And as soon as they got on camera, you could just tell one had this energy that was undeniable. And the other, while maybe logistically speaking was a better choice, it just didn't have the same energy. And so even in, in that type of setting, you put people on a camera and you can just, you can just see it. And, and so I would challenge anybody that's making a film to look for that in, in the casting process. And you'll know it when you see it. it, it it's, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You just have to be paying attention. You know? and, and that's what Jacob had. Uh, I remember I brought him in based off of a, a video they had made and kind of, uh, I think with the, the casting person and he was just talking and, and you know, he had this great accent, these crazy teeth and 
this great energy, uh, but it wasn't until I brought him in and put him on camera with me in the room that I realized he could, he could make it. And you know, the first day he shot with McConaughey, I remember he was driving a boat really fast and had to like launch it up onto the bank. And he, we kept telling him, we're like, and you're really gonna have to, you know, gun it to get on. And he launched the boat out of the water and it like skidded across the ground toward the camera. And uh, McConaughey turned around and Jacob just smiles like, are you ready to do that again? And um, <laughs> he just had, the kid was fearless, you know, and that applied for his behavior in front of the camera too. Okay, so do you think that with Jacob's type of character, obviously he was supposed to play some sort of uh, country guy, you know, when we visited him, it was on the set of the show, The Sun, and it's about, um, you know, Native Americans and people coming down south, you know, and clashing with them. And um, kind of a different role for Jacob. So do you think that, you know, people that get uh, put in a role because of the type of character they are in real life, can that develop um, into a different kind of character as they act more? Sure, I mean, I think if they're really good. <laughs> um, some people are, they're just gonna be able to do that one thing. Um, there's some very, very famous celebrities that I think just pretty much do one thing, but they're really good at it. They make millions of dollars and people buy magazines about them. But I think, um, you know, I think if you're going to make acting a profession, uh, which I couldn't do, uh, there's no way I could do it. Uh, at some point you're going to have to come up against um, I guess they call it craft. Uh, I think a lot of time is wasted by actors sometimes um, just because they're nervous and uh, insecure. But I, but I think at some point you're going to come up against you know, the need to push yourself outside of the bounds of who you are. And that's, that's when you really start acting. You know? There's this other thing, which is you being comfortable in front of a camera, which is insanely valuable and a unique talent in and of itself. But then there's the other level. And that's when you start to get, you know, I, I find it fascinating. Every actor is, you know, like this supercomputer that you kind of have to decode and, and different ones need and want different things. Some like to talk out their parts incessantly before uh, you work with them. Mike Shannon and I never talk about anything, you know. McConaughey had very specific things that he wanted to talk about and then he was good. Um, so they're all different, different types of things. And I think as a director, you know, you have to, you have to be there for your actor and figure out what it is they need. Um, sometimes they need someone, a lot of times they need someone just to tell them they're doing a good job. Nice. Um, so going back to like all of your films, again, um, you have a really stylized look, like auteur style. Um, and it, like you can tell when, when you're watching one of your movies uh, from your characters, from your locations, it's like, it's blue collar working class citizens sort of in rural areas a lot of times. Um, how did that develop and how did it start and what is that from? Well, um, that really started to come together in film school. Uh, like I said, I'd never made anything before. Uh, I went to film school, this was in the late 90s. And I had a professor there, the same one that introduced me to Mike Shannon, who introduced me to contemporary Southern fiction uh, writers like Harry Cruz and Barry Brown. I had already read Faulkner, but I didn't understand him yet. Um, I was a big fan of Flannery O'Connor's as well. Uh, but I started to think about myself in relationship to being a storyteller. Uh, and there was a time, I think in high school, I was writing short stories. And I was talking to my dad, who's always been really supportive of all this. And I told him I wanted to write like a New York mob movie. I think I had just seen Goodfellas. And, um, and he's like, why do you want to do that? What do you know about New York? I was like, I don't know, I know that the mob is there. And, um, and he was like, well, have you ever heard of the Dixie Mafia? Um, he's like, I think you should write something that you, that you know, which is a, obviously everyone's heard that one. But it, it was surprising, you know, even having heard it, it still, I just still didn't understand it. I didn't really accept it. I just, plus, I didn't think anybody would want what I knew. Um, and in college, I started to, to really start to understand what was unique about my point of view in the world. And I actually grew up in Little Rock in the suburbs. 
I was like a totally normal, any anywhere USA kind of kid growing up, uh, going to see movies and everything else. But my grandparents were from a really small town called Alzheimer, which was a cotton town about an hour southeast of Little Rock. And I used to spend summers there, and and I got to I got this great access because I think had I grown up in that town, I, I maybe would have hated it and resented it and just wanted to get away from it. But because I had this, you know, outsider point of view with with insider access, um, I fell in love with it, and I realized that that's what I had that was maybe different than than other people, and and that began to shape my point of view as a storyteller. And, and once you've started to have that realization, everything in my life, up to Alienation, which is the film I'm, I'm trying to get made right now, I don't know what to do about an alien movie in LA or New York, but if it takes place in Arkansas, it becomes to get very interesting to me, <laughs> which it does. <laughs> um, I think that we might open it up to some questions from the audience, if you guys have anything. Not seeing anybody, but Berkeley will come around with the microphone. Hi, my name is Marcus. I am a film student here in Austin at the Austin School of Film. Uh, my question is, when you first started making films in, in, in film school, or um, you know, earlier in your career, when was the first time you realized, like, what was the first time you made something that you genuinely felt like it had your voice or something that kind of like had a style that you knew could be yours? Or was it something that kind of, you just sort of built upon throughout your films and it kind of like developed? It definitely developed. Uh, to be honest, the first time anything really clicked for me in a substantial way was after film school. I had moved home to Little Rock. Uh, I lived with my parents. I worked at a pizza place um, for about a year, and I tried to write a script, and I did. I wrote two scripts, actually. I wrote a script based on my um, senior thesis film, which a bunch of people really liked, and that script was terrible, uh, <laughs> unreadable. But then I, so then I rolled up my sleeves, and I sat down to write the film, whatever that was gonna be. Uh, I wanted it to feel like a Larry Brown short story. I, I wanted it to take place in Arkansas. I had all these things, and um, it was called uh, The Blue Side. And it's never been made. It's actually the only script, other than this, that other one, it's the only script I've written that hasn't been made, except for Alien Nation. And, um, oh, that's not true. I wrote a TV pilot once that didn't get made. Um, <laughs> only feature film script. And maybe one day I'll make it, but. But it, it was the first time I ever thought I'd done something really good. Um, I couldn't get it made, but, but it felt like it, it reflected the point of view that I wanted to start presenting to the world. Um, that, that was really it. In film school, it was smaller things. I remember my freshman five-minute film, uh, video project, you know, there was one shot that I used the dolly on, and there was an older kid sitting next to me. Uh, we were on these totally outdated computer systems editing it, and, um, and he leaned over and he saw it, and he's like, oh, well, somebody thinks they're a director. And, um, and I was really proud of that moment. Uh, there were, there were uh, several things, but that's a different question that I don't know if you want the answer to that, which is, at what point did I start to actually believe in myself as a filmmaker? That took a long time. There, there were dinner parties I would go to after I made my first film, and I would tell people I make movies and kind of giggle, because the idea still seems so, so silly. Um, so that took a long time to kind of break that, break that down, because kids from Arkansas weren't really supposed to make movies. Um, and, but, but ownership of, of, a, of a point of view, that really started to come after that one script. And, uh, and then I just refined it, I think, from there. Question? Thanks. Anybody else? There. My sister's yelling at me. She's up there. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, Will. Um, hi, my name is Mary. I'm very proud of Will. 
Also, um, so I have a question about the movie we just watched, if that's okay. Um, what was the inspiration behind Alton's entity? Because like, I'm really into paranormal true crime stuff and there's a thing called the Black Eyed Kids, I'm not sure if you've heard of that. It's kind of like a legend. Okay, well you should look into that because that's really, I seriously thought that's what was going on. Um, but basically they're, they're kind of paranormal and um, I know that there was like one line where it mentioned there wasn't any radiation. So I just was kind of curious about what he was. Is that up to us to decide or um, did you have a certain vision for that generally? Well, the movie wasn't really successful enough to demand a sequel. Um, so now, yes, it is left up to you. Um, the, you know, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to answer honestly, so I'm really thinking back uh, to when the idea of a, of a kid with special powers started. Because I actually think that I had that idea before I actually knew what the movie was about. Um, and that happens a lot. And this question inevitably will be unsatisfying for you. That's okay. Um, <laughs> but I understand it. It's not for lack of understanding. Right. Well, that's, that's something, um, it's, it's, it just paralleled with that. I yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll, look into, I'll look into what you're, you're saying. What I, when I write, typically, I, I have two different um, tracks that I work on at once. Um, and sometimes the train gets ahead of the other on one track. Uh, and with this, I, I could sit and tell you basically the opening of the film all the way to when they go to um, the old creepy guy's house who sneaks in and, and out and is shooting beams out of his eyes. Um, I could tell you that pretty much shot for shot back when I was making Take Shelter, and I still didn't know what the movie was about. So I'd had some, some ideas about a, a kid with special powers, but I didn't really know where it was going or what it was going to add up to. And when I sat down to write the film, uh, my son was a, a year old at the time, um, actually a little bit older, and he had had a febrile seizure, um, which is a, a thing that kids grow out of around the age of three, but it's a reaction to a, a spike in fever. Some kids' bodies just can't handle it and they go into a seizure. But we didn't know that. And my wife and I were around when, when my son had a seizure and it was terrifying. And we ran him to St. David's Hospital and it was really scary. And uh, I think you, during your child's, especially their first year, you think a lot about um, your lack of control over that situation. And you think of, of your, the lack of, of your ability to actually protect him from anything serious. You, you, you have to get to a really weird kind of zen place about it or else you just kill yourself with worry which there's a lot of that too and that's when i realized who the people in the front seat of the car were not just the kid in the back and uh and that's when this kind of weird sci-fi movie about two guys on a run with a kid with special powers in the back seat um started to become maybe a little bit more specifically more specific to my life um but there was and I had been reading some books about parallel dimensions and other things, and um, I thought the idea that there would be a world built on top of ours was something interesting, and that maybe this kid was somehow tuned into that. Um, you know, that, that was, you know, I started to get into that a little bit, for sure. Sorry. No, that's cool. That's really interesting. Um, I just have a very small question. Yeah. I love Adam Driver. What was it like to work with him? How amazing is he? He's fun to watch. Yeah, so. uh, I love Adam Driver too. Um, <laughs> I genuinely do. I didn't really know who he was when, when we set out to cast him. Uh, I hadn't watched Girls and he hadn't done, in fact, his first day of filming on this was the day that they announced his role in Star Wars and none of us knew. Um, we were surprised. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and, <coughs> you know, um, I spoke to him on the phone, he'd read the script, and my casting director, Francine Maisley, who's a very important casting director in, in LA, the last thing she told me before I spoke to him was, just try to get him to say yes. Uh, she knew how valuable he was, because she probably knew he was gonna be in Star Wars before I did. Um, but he ended up having a connection to Arkansas. His father had lived there for a time, and he had grown up there at a the time, and um, 
he'd actually seen some of my films, uh, which is surprising and, and, and great. And um, and he just, he ended up being, uh, he's different than Michael Shannon. He's, he's similar in the fact that you can watch from take to take. There are all these small differences and every take's interesting. He's always doing something. Um, and you never, you're never exactly sure what's gonna come out. Um, but all of it's in the wheelhouse, all of it's usable. Well, most of it. And, um, and, and I respond to that maybe more than anything, is, it, is an actor that can live within the framework of the script, but give you all of these options within that. And Adam does that. Uh, I think he's a, he's a really special actor. And beyond that, actually since making Midnight Special, we've become friends and I've gotten to know him and he's actually a genuinely good person, uh, which is another rare thing to find. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Berkeley, where are you? It's going to the top. It's going to the top. Hi, thank you. Uh, hi, my name's Caleb. I have a couple questions. I'll start with the first one. It's about uh, one, film. One question, please. Okay. Uh, <laughs> regarding film school, do you think it's worth spending the money to go to like a four-year school for to study film, or is it just better to just jump straight into it and use that money just to finance uh, a first project or something? Yeah, I think that's a totally fair question, and, and everybody's gonna have to discover their own answer to that one. Um, I was talking to these guys earlier about it. You know, art school's a tricky thing. No one can teach you how to be talented, um, but they can't help you refine any talent and maybe unearth some talent. Um, for me, film school was integral. I just wouldn't have done this on my own. Uh, part of that was the time period that I was growing up and, and getting into film school. Now, obviously, you have a lot more tools at your fingertips than I did. But for me, uh, first and foremost, film school was about meeting people. You know, my cinematographer who shot all of my films, uh, we met in college. I still work with a lot of people from, from my film school. My sound designer is incredible. Um, so I think first and foremost, you're going to, to meet other people that can help you make something and that you can help them make something. Uh, it's hard It's hard to build that out of scratch. In a town like Austin, maybe. Um, and, and so you know, your options here are maybe a little bit different because there are people here actively, uh, a lot of people here actively making things. Um, but you know, when it comes to, to professors and things, you just kind of have to take, it's your responsibility to see what you can take from them. Um, you'll have some good ones and you'll have some bad ones, but maybe all of them have something to give. Uh, you just have to be smart enough to figure out what that is. Um, and and that, that assignment's on your shoulders. Uh, and and, and don't, let, don't let the bad advice rile you, you know. Um, also, I mean, it's, a, it's an issue of economics like you talk about. You know, for me, I don't think I could have even gotten into NYU or USC. I don't think I even tried, but I certainly couldn't have afforded them. Uh, and, and so I found North Carolina School of the Arts uh, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and it was a public school, which was still pretty expensive because I was out of state, but my parents took out a second mortgage on a home and we were able to go. Um, but the thing that attracted me was that it was an undergraduate program that immediately, it was like a trade school. They started teaching you how to make films because I was young and impatient. Hmm. And I didn't want to spend four years at a liberal arts school, you know, studying um, theory only to be maybe granted, you know, a slot in their graduate program later, which I also couldn't afford. Um, so I chose not to go to graduate school. I instead found a program that had kind of a graduate feel to it for an undergraduate program. And, um, and any money that maybe would have been spent on graduate school, I spent on my first feature. Um, but, you know, I'll also say this, a lot, of the, a lot of the student films that came out of that undergraduate program, while technically proficient, really were kind of lame uh, because I went in and it was all Pulp Fiction ripoffs, and I left and it was all Wes Anderson ripoffs. <laughs> and so um, I, I don't think you can discount a little bit of life experience, too. Um, and that's just something you're going to have to calculate for yourself. But, uh, you know, yeah, I think I'm certainly, you know, it's not an up or down vote, really. It's a, it's a personal calculation that you have to make. I, I know that for me, uh, I wouldn't be sitting here without it. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you all for coming.